wish you had been there to see her behaviour. And as to Captain Wentworth's liking Louisa as well as Henrietta, it is nonsense to say so, for he certainly does like Henrietta a great deal the best. But Charles is so positive. I wish you had been with us yesterday, for then you might have decided between us, and I am sure you would have thought as I did, unless you had been determined to give it against me. A dinner at Mr. Musgrove's had been the occasion when all these things should have been seen by Anne, but she had stayed at home, under the mixed plea of a headache of her own, and some return of indisposition in little Charles. She had thought only of avoiding Captain Wentworth, but an escape from being appealed to as umpire was now added to the advantages of a quiet evening. As to Captain Wentworth's views, she deemed it of more consequence that he should know his own mind early enough not to be endangering the happiness of either sister, or impeaching his own honour, than that he should prefer Henrietta to Louisa, or Louisa to Henrietta. Either of them would, in all probability, make him an affectionate, good-humoured wife. With regard to Charles Hayter, she had a delicacy which must be pained by any lightness of conduct in a well-meaning young woman, and a heart to sympathise in any of the sufferings it occasioned. But if Henrietta found herself mistaken in the nature of her feelings, the alternation could not be understood too soon. Charles Hayter had met with much to disquiet and mortify him in his cousin's behaviour. She had too old a regard for him to be so wholly estranged as might in two meetings extinguish every past hope, and leave him nothing to do but to keep away from Uppercross. But there was such a change as became very alarming, when such a man as Captain Wentworth was to be regarded as the probable cause. He had been absent only two Sundays, and when they parted, had left her interested, even to the height of his wishes, in his prospect of soon quitting his present curacy, and obtaining that of Uppercross instead. It had then seemed the object nearest her heart, that Dr. Shirley, the rector, who for more than forty years had been zealously discharging all the duties of his office, but was now growing too infirm for many of them, should be quite fixed on engaging a curate, should make his curacy quite as good as he could afford, and should give Charles Hayter the promise of it. The advantage of his having come only to Uppercross, instead of going six miles another way, of his having, in every respect, a better curacy, of his belonging to their dear Dr. Shirley, and of dear good Dr. Shirley's being relieved from the duty which he could no longer get through, without most injurious fatigue, had been a great deal, even to Louisa, but had been almost everything to Henrietta. When he came back, alas, the zeal of the business was gone by. Louisa could not listen at all to his account of a conversation which he had just held with Dr. Shirley. She was at a window, looking out for Captain Wentworth, and even Henrietta had at best only a divided attention to give, and seemed to have forgotten all the former doubt and solicitude of the negotiation. "'Well, I am very glad indeed. But I always thought you would have it. I always thought you sure. It did not appear to me that—in short, you know, Dr. Shirley must have a curate.' and you had secured his promise. Is he coming, Louisa?" One morning, very soon after the dinner at the Musgroves, at which Anne had not been present, Captain Wentworth walked into the drawing-room at the cottage, where were only herself and the little invalid Charles, who was lying on the sofa. The surprise of finding himself almost alone with Anne Elliot deprived his manners of their usual composure. He started, and could only say, "'I thought the Miss Musgroves had been here. Mrs. Musgrove told me I should find them here, before he walked to the window to recollect himself, and feel how he ought to behave. "'They are upstairs with my sister. They will be down in a few moments, I dare say,' had been Anne's reply, in all the confusion that was natural, and if the child had not called her to come and do something for him, she would have been out of the room the next moment, and released Captain Wentworth as well as herself. He continued at the window, and after calmly and politely saying, I hope the little boy is better," was silent. She was obliged to kneel down by the sofa, and remain there to satisfy her patient, and thus they continued a few minutes, when, to her very great satisfaction, she heard some other person crossing the little vestibule. She hoped, on turning her head, to see the master of the house, but it proved to be one much less calculated for making matters easy. Charles Hayter, probably not at all better pleased by the sight of Captain Wentworth, than Captain Wentworth had been by the side of Anne. She only attempted to say, "'How do you do? Will you not sit down? The others will be here presently.' Captain Wentworth, however, came from his window, apparently not ill-disposed for conversation, 
But Charles Hayter soon put an end to his attempts by seating himself near the table, and taking up the newspaper, and Captain Wentworth returned to his window. Another minute brought another addition. The younger boy, a remarkable, stout, forward child of two years old, having got the door opened for him by someone without, made his determined appearance among them, and went straight to the sofa to see what was going on, and put in his claim to anything good that might be giving away. There being nothing to eat, he could only have some play, and as his aunt would not let him tease his sick brother, he began to fasten himself upon her, as she knelt, in such a way that, busy as she was about Charles, she could not shake him off. She spoke to him, ordered, entreated, and insisted in vain. Once she did contrive to push him away, but the boy had the greater pleasure in getting upon her back again directly. Walter, said she, get down this moment. You are extremely troublesome. I am very angry with you. Walter, cried Charles Hayter, why do you not do as you are bid? Do you not hear your aunt speak? Come to me, Walter, come to cousin Charles. But not a bit did Walter stir. In another moment, however, she found herself in the state of being released from him. Some one was taking him from her, though he had bent down her head so much that his little sturdy hands were unfastened from around her neck, and he was resolutely borne away, before she knew that Captain Wentworth had done it. Her sensations on the discovery made her perfectly speechless. She could not even thank him. She could only hang over little Charles with most disordered feelings. His kindness in stepping forward to her relief, the manner, the silence in which it had passed, the little particulars of the circumstance, with the conviction soon forced on her by the noise he was studiously making with the child, that he meant to avoid hearing her thanks, and rather sought to testify that her conversation was the last of his wants, produced such a confusion of varying, but very painful agitation, as she could not recover from, till enabled by the entrance of Mary and the Miss Musgroves to make over her little patient to their cares, and leave the room. She could not stay. It might have been an opportunity of watching the loves and jealousies of the four, they were now all together, but she could stay for none of it. It was evident that Charles Hayter was not well inclined towards Captain Wentworth. She had a strong impression of his having said, in a vexed tone of voice, after Captain Wentworth's interference, "'You ought to have minded me, Walter. I told you not to tease your aunt,' and could comprehend his regretting that Captain Wentworth should do what he ought to have done himself. But neither Charles Hayter's feelings, nor anybody's feelings, could interest her, till she had a little better arranged her own. She was ashamed of herself, quite ashamed of being so nervous, so overcome by such a trifle. But so it was, and it required a long application of solitude and reflection to recover her. End of chapter 9